everybody, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Is my screen sharing properly? Could somebody just give me a message? Yes, you're fine, Mary. Oh, great. Okay. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody is keeping well. Um, as the introduction said, my name's Mary. I'm a physio. I'm currently training to be a journalist as well, which has changed since my, my last CV, and I'm um, based in Ireland. I'd uh, first like to thank the AMT committee for inviting me uh, to speak. I was meant to speak last year, but I actually had a, a vomiting bug. So my main interest is public communication about back pain and public understanding of back pain. So today I'm going to be talking about a trial I did during my time in Australia. And what I was looking at was how do people react to different labels for low back pain? So the words we use with people with low back pain, do they matter? What do they mean for us in the clinic? And are there better ways to communicate with people with back pain? So to kick us off, when we look at the current guidelines for how to talk to somebody with back pain, it really depends on the type of back pain we're dealing with. So on the left side, we're talking about specific spinal pathology. So as a physio or a massage therapist, we're very look, don't see a lot of this group. This is less than 1% of back pain in primary care. And if we refer them on immediately. So these aren't the people that we're dealing with talking to every day about back pain. In the second category, we have radicular syndromes. So they are people that have back pain, but where their leg pain and leg symptoms are more prominent. So that could be with uh, nerve root involvement. It could be with spinal stenosis. But on the right, this is the group that we are really dealing with. So uh, physiotherapists on the front line, massage therapists on the front line, we're dealing with the group that researchers and guidelines like to call non-specific low back pain. And we'll get on to a bit of the, the discussion and the problems with this label in a moment. But this is really referring to back pain where we're currently not able to say definitively what is the actual cause of this person's back pain. You know, is it a physical cause, a physical structural cause? Is it uh, more psychological drivers, social drivers? We're not sure. So we're left with this kind of label, non-specific low back pain. The problem is this label creates all sorts of reactions. Actions. So even your conference researchers, even though we have this label, we're not always a big of it. Clinicians, there seems to be a good bit of kickback amongst physios and doctors um, in particular about the, the use of this label. So, you know, it doesn't really help us make any treatment choices. People with a lived experience of pain might find it dismissive and that it doesn't really create certainty about what's causing a person's pain. So there's lots of discussion here and there's lots of arguments about what's a better alternative to this label if the current label isn't good enough. So since this label isn't popular amongst a lot of clinicians, a lot of clinicians use other labels for back pain. So top, topical ones would be ones relating to the disc, like disc bulges, slip discs, uh, muscles and ligaments like sprains and strains, degeneration and wear and tear. And what we don't know about these labels is, does the benefit of giving these labels, so in terms of providing people with maybe a certainty of what might be causing their pain, does the benefit outweigh the harm, the potential harm of giving people these particular labels for their condition? So here are some of the potential problems with labels that made me interested in looking into them in more detail in a trial. So number one, in the clinic at the moment, we don't have very good clinical tests to identify if a particular structure is contributing to a person's back pain. And again, this is heavily debated. Some clinicians say, I am able to identify if a disc bulge is a cause of pain, but really based on the current evidence, it's kind of wishy-washy. We're not really sure unless somebody has a really specific pathology we can't really be ever sure what's really causing their um, back pain. The, the other issue is many of these labels we use to represent stuff on imaging, many of these findings on imaging are common in people that have never had back pain or never will experience back pain. So if you scan anyone really from the ages of 25 all the way up to 90, they're going to have lots of stuff on their scans, lots of disc bulges, arthritis, facet joint degeneration, as they age, but that doesn't necessarily say that it's causing their pain 
or if indeed it, that, that they will develop pain at all. The next one, which is probably one of the most important, is we now view back pain as a multifactorial subjective experience that lots of different factors in a person's life or surroundings can influence the pain experience and the level of disability that's involved. And by giving someone one label for their condition, you're kind of locking off their, their way of conceptualizing that experience. If you, you tell someone they have a disc bulge, that would then make them think about back pain from a very structural or biomedical perspective. And that might have implications then for their overall understanding of their pain going forward. And most importantly, onto that, onto the, the, the nature of pain, it might cause people to want tests and treatments that they don't need. And as a massage therapist or a physiotherapist or anybody else that might be trying to provide or encourage more non-drug interventions, more active management, if, if someone is given a particular label, this might be a real barrier for us because if someone gets a particular biomedical label, and this is what I wanted to find out, they might think they need a, bi a very biomedical treatment, whether it be an injection or surgery. So there could be all different types of problems with the messages we give to people with back pain in terms of how they view their experience and how they view how they should be treated. The problem is we lack labeling literature. So at the moment, or b before I went into conducting this trial, there had been perspective pieces put forward talking about how words might influence some back pain. But the issue is, as a clinician, we, we, we have very little guidance on what words we should be using, what words we shouldn't be using, and what's the best word to use. So what, what we really need there is a trial, comparing different words and see how people react to those different words. So this is what I did when I was in Australia. I conducted a large online randomized trial where people with back pain and members of the public were randomized to receive different labels for back pain. And I wanted to see if you give people different labels, does it have a different effect on their need to go for imaging? Do they want to go for surgery or more willing to go for surgery, depending on what label or word you use for their back pain? Need for a second opinion, how serious they think their condition is, do they think they'll recover? And are they willing to engage with work and physical activity? So as a massage therapist or a physiotherapist, all these questions are very important. Um, how a person's thinking, if what we're saying is influencing that, we need to know about it. So we looked at six labels, which I'll talk about in a moment. So six words that were used. And we included up to almost 1,500 people from Australia, Canada, and Ireland. And they were all recruited online and did this um, trial online. And we had people with and without low back pain because we wanted people with persistent low back pain, acute low back pain, and people that didn't have back pain at all. And that was one of, that was actually a really hard part of the, the trial was trying to find people that never had an episode of back pain. That was almost a finding in itself. It, it took a really long time. So it can be tricky to try and identify if a word you use influences somebody with back pain. So the way this is generally done in other fields is you, you give them a scenario. So you, so you give them an example of them having back pain and going to the clinic. So the scenario we gave them was like this. We gave them a picture of somebody with back pain. We said, imagine you are suffering from an episode of back pain. You go to your healthcare provider and we named some healthcare providers. Uh, we named massage therapist, we named physio, we named chiropractor, doctor your healthcare provider asks you some questions to rule out any worrying causes. So we're trying to create a, a credible clinical scenario. And then we talk them through a detailed physical exam. And after this, the healthcare provider tells you. So this, at this stage of the trial, this is where people were randomized to six different labels. So across the, the group, so in total, we had 1,375 people and people were randomized to receive one different label. So it's um, six groups um different labels for each group so the labels we wanted to test were a disc bulge degeneration of the spine arthritis of spine 
a lumbar sprain. So we use those first four because they're very commonly used in clinical practice and they're very common imaging findings and findings that come up in the literature for pain. We use non-specific low back pain because the guideline recommend term and we've had no research actually with people with back pain to see what they think of this term given its popularity, which has been quite strange. And then the last label was one that we came up with with some consumers with an experience of low back pain, which basically is why can't we just call spade spade and call it back pain? That, that's what we want. I think I slipped off there. I think I'm going okay. Is there sound now? Yes, Mary, we can hear you. Okay, I'm back on. So I'm sorry about that. It's just my internet connection. So an important part of the trial is we provided people with reassurance. So after they received the label, they were told that they would get better, that they should engage with physical activity and work again, because we wanted to really see that if a label has a negative influence, can it be removed by providing good advice? So I spoke through the outcomes already. So we looked at imaging, we looked at second opinion, surgery and recovery and a few other things on a 10 point or a six point scale for people with back pain. And from a baseline characteristic um, perspective, so we had 1,375 people in the trial on average, people were 41 years of age, mainly female, and they had pain that was five out of 10 and their disability was low enough. And what we basically found to sum up quickly before I get on to the other results is participants given the more non-medical labels. So if you told people episode back pain, sprain or non-specific low back pain, they perceive less need for imaging second opinion and surgery compared to disc bulge arthritis and degeneration. So the more medical the label, the worse the outcome. And the same labels were associated with less perceived seriousness of low back pain and higher recovery expectations. So really the results were very consistent. The more uncertain or vague the label, the better the results for people with back pain. They preferred the more vague labels, even though we saw no difference for beliefs about work and physical activity. So in this section, instead of getting into the numbers, I really want to explain or give Sorry, I mean, it's cut off there. So I'm just going to describe how people react to the label. So, so first, if you look at some of the reactions to disc bulge, so what people were saying was fear of ending up in a wheelchair and not being able to work in the future, disaster, a lifetime of pain, an external body bulge that sounds life worsening. It doesn't sound like it will kill me, but it sounds like it will ruin many physical parts in my life. So you can see that these are just two words, disc bulge. But you can see it led to huge emotional reactions on the participants. So they were already thinking they won't recover and that they would be disabled for life. So again, this shows the effect that your words can have with somebody with back pain. With degeneration, it was similar. 
So people were saying dying spine, I reckon. My spine is crumbling and not able to support me. Makes me feel sad that I could end up in a wheelchair. So again, very, very negative reaction to language that's used. Can you imagine in the clinic if somebody has been given this term and, and you're trying to encourage them that they'll recover, but they're thinking these future consequences for themselves. Um, it has a likely to have a big influence on their overall pain intensity and disability. And arthritis is similar negative feelings. So lots of mentions of wheelchairs, pain like broken glass grinding between your bones. So really emotive, strong language going with these labels. But the interesting thing is if you click to the three labels that did better in the trial, you can see a different reaction. So with lumbar sprain, people are saying it will heal quickly. It's sort of like an ankle sprain where you need to rest it a bit, but then you can get back to normal activities. And I think most of it is temporary. So what we'll chat about in a moment is lumbar sprain was associated with the highest recovery expectations in the trial, but also people associated with a lot of tissue damage. So that, so, so it's kind of interesting from that perspective because we don't want people always thinking that back pain is linked to tissue damage, but we want them feeling likely to recover. So sprain had kind of a positive and a negative influence. And again, non-specific, there were concerns that people wouldn't like this label, but in general, people thought non-specific was something that would go away with time. There was some uncertainty, like some people didn't like the term non-specific in terms of want to have more information, but in general, people responded quite well to it. And people saw it as back pain that's part of everyday life, you know, if they were doing some weeding or lifting, that it was a common experience that anybody could have. So again, that was kind of surprising because people expected that non-specific low back pain would be poorly accepted. And then finally, the, the, the label that was thought up of by people with back pain seemed to be the most well accepted label in the trial. So we had a, a person with a lived experience of low back pain was an author on our trial. And this was one of the labels that we came up with together. So an episode of back pain, you know, very uncertain, very non-specific label, but people felt that this was a short span of back pain that should resolve with time, temporary, and that it was something that would get better. And this is, you know, if you just contrast this to disc bulge or degeneration, you know, there's only a difference of a word and it just has such a different experience on that individual in front of you in terms of what they think going forward is going to happen to them. So, so reflections. So I was quite surprised that non low back pain was well accepted. It challenges are thinking that people with back pain need certainty all the time. So if people can be given a label like episode of back pain or non-specific low back pain, it makes us, I guess you could say, relieved that we don't have to force a label on a person. We don't have to give certainty where it's not always there. Episode of low back pain, which skips the annoying part of the word non-specific was, was well accepted. So maybe in clinic calling it just back pain and giving people reassurance could be a way to go with, 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 with some people with pain. Lumbar sprain was well accepted, but it was associated with high feelings of tissue damage. So again, in your clinical practice, it might be hard to know if this would suit all people with pain. For example, if you get somebody with, that has persistent pain, and let's say a person that doesn't recall a trigger for their, for their back pain, giving them the label sprain might not make sense in their life story because let's say the person with persistent pain, their pain hasn't recovered, sprain should recover. So that might be a mismatch between how they feel and what you're saying. And also a lot of people with back pain can't recall any physical trigger. So the idea of giving them a very physical label doesn't make sense. And it really questions then the power of reassurance. So no matter what type of healthcare professional you are, this kind of trial, and it's just one trial, it, it, it kind of found that if a person gets a label that's negative, the positive stuff we say doesn't have a huge influence on that. You know, the actual education that they're going to get better 
seems to be too late in the process if someone has a bad label. But what might be important is if we're able to expose people to the activities that they're afraid of. And that's not something I'm able to comment on in the trial, but maybe they need more movement. They need to feel that their back is capable of doing stuff, whether it be applying pressure on it, being able to take you know, pressure. Maybe words alone to try and reassure people are, aren't enough. And from a future research perspective, you know, what we don't know is, let's say you're the massage therapist and a person comes in and they already have that negative label that, that causes those negative problems. What do we do? We're not really sure what's the best way to handle this. Also, people with low back pain, if they've had back pain a long time and they can often be under huge cycle pressure because the systems we we work and live in are more biomedical in origin. People with back pain can be forced to find a physical re reason for their pain. So often this can this can clash then with trying to to change how we label back pain. And we know that people that don't have a cause for their pain can often feel stigmatized and excluded. So this is something really that we'd have to work with people with pain together on so that if they take on a more uncertain label that seems to have more positive influence, that it doesn't have a downside in another, in another way, um, in a social way. And maybe there are better labels. So some people have suggested lumbago, for example, and they aren't labels that we've examined in the trial. So the take home messages from this trial would be what you call low back pain matters. The words you're using matter, the language you're using ma matter from the time the person goes in the door to, they leave, to when they leave. So when you're doing your, your, your treatment, how you're communicating, how it works, how you're communicating, what you're doing matters to that person in front of you. So, so language, labels, words are really important. Consider avoiding terms like disc bulge, degeneration and arterial labels, really kind of checking your language to make sure that you're not using labels that might have downsides. On a clinical level, weigh up the benefits and risks of using different labels. As I've said, sprain might be good for some people that have acute back pain that can recall a very physical trigger. But for people with persistent back pain or people that can't recall a physical trigger, it might not be helpful. A non-specific might not be a term that's nice for some people. So you might need to work around that. Don't be afraid not to give a diagnosis. So what I mean here is, People with pain are capable of living with uncertainty. Sometimes like a, a, the pain experience can be uncertain. It can vary from individual to individual. Different factors can be relevant. We shouldn't always be forcing ourselves to give people a magic answer or a magic bullet to why they have pain. Because, because often, as I said, it's a multidimensional experience and people will find, could find their own journey and own pathway through which best way to, to, to treat pain. And on a clinical level, maybe a societal level, changing how we talk to people with back pain and how we label it and what, what, what terms we attribute to back pain may reduce unnecessary care, you know, imaging, surgery, and the acceptability of more non-medical options and promote recovery. So that's all for me. I'd just like to thank my team in Australia. There was a quite a large team involved in this trial and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I'm so sorry about my internet. I live in a very rural area and this happens a lot. So thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thanks very much for that. That's wonderful. Um, and yes, being on the other side of the, the world, we can understand that the technology sometimes doesn't catch up. So um, we do have a couple of questions for you. Um, and we've got um, about nine minutes for question and answer. So um, I'll, I'll go with the first question from Monica. Uh, is the client adequately educated about the different, con different conditions prior to being given a diagnosis? Perhaps a lack of education, um, sorry, perhaps a lack of education and misinformation about the diagnosis and or conditions or labels are an issue in itself. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think in in general, in general, in clinical life, people probably aren't well educated about uh, before being given a diagnosis. 
Um, there are lots of misconceptions about particular, uh, pr particular diagnostic labels. And um, I think it's all about time as well. If you have time as a clinician to give more time to answering more information about diagnosis, maybe that can help um, um, some of the problems. I, I think a really big issue is the prevalence of a lot of these diagnostic structural problems in people without back pain. I think on a societal level, people aren't aware of that, that you can have these problems, you can have these things on imaging and they might not be um, a source of, of, of pain. But lots of misinformation about back pain in general and uh, a need for wider education, um, yeah. for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, also, um, any evidence that different personality types respond to different labels? That, that's a really good question, actually. We're actually following up on that. We measured people's anxiety levels in the trial, um, anxiety and depression levels, and we want to see, did people react differently? We don't know at the moment. What we do think is that the effect of the label was pretty consistent across people. So people that never had back pain, which, which I mentioned was very hard to find, they reacted as badly to the labels as people that have back pain or the people that have had back pain for a long time. So they seem to be universally negative, a lot of these labels, but that's a, that's a good question. And that's something that we're following up on. Okay, thank you. Um, and did you find that encouraged active treatment within a safe treatment zone assisted with positive response compared to with passive treatment? Can you just say that a question again? Sorry, I was kind of reading it as well. Oh, okay. yeah. Did you find that encouraged active treatment within a safe treatment zone assisted with positive response compared with passive treatment? Yeah, I think there's a role for both of these things. So I think what I was saying there um, regarding the trial, when, when people get reassurance alone, um, just education, and we can see this in uh, wider terms at the moment. Um, some people seem to be moving away from hands-on approaches for, for back pain, you know, more to education only. But, but I think what our trial is showing that if someone has a very, um, a very um, scary view of their spine, that it's crumbling apart and that it's very vulnerable, um, how you combine active, um, I, I don't know. I, I think the active and passive um, contrast between treatments can be a bit unfair because massage can be a very active treatment and educational in itself. And the hands-on can be very uh, reassuring for people with back pain. For somebody, let's say, that feels their back is crumbling apart, you could uh, really use your hands to, to reassure them that that's not the case, combined with active treatment like activity and movement. Um, I hope that I, that has answered your question okay, but but I think in these cases there would be a, a role for uh, combined approaches. Okay, so um, so are we better off asking a client what they think is going on and helping them feel more comfortable with their understanding? Is that the, better than giving labels? Is that yes, yeah. yes, I, th I think so, and. Um, and, and again, it, it, I, just coming back to the, the start of my presentation, it really depends on the type of back pain you're dealing with. Obviously, if, if it's a very serious spinal pathology, that person gets a label and they uh, benefit from the label. But for people in general, I think having a really good therapeutic alliance with them, understanding their experience, understanding... Um, listening to their perspective on their pain. I think if people feel listened to and they feel that they're getting a, a treatment plan that's tailored to them, um, I think you can overcome a lot of the, uh, the barriers that might go with labeling somebody. But, yeah. it, but it's, a re it's kind of like a new area really. Um, so so um, I'd love to do more research in it or if, if people even had more ideas, um, that would be great. Yeah, it's such a complex, um uh issue i suppose so it is um to to break down that complexity um yeah what sort of advice would you give massage therapists apart from say listening to them and and supporting them is there anything else that you can offer massage therapists to help break down that complexity of this issue 
I think as a massage therapist, I would be uh, the same advice as I'd uh, give to physios is, is really thinking how the effect of your treatments have both physical, psychological and emotional effects. So when you're delivering your treatment, always being aware of, okay, so what I'm providing physically and what I'm, um, is what I'm saying matching up with that? So am I giving a coherent message that what I'm doing physically with my hands is what's coming out of my mouth, the same kind of message um, together? Um, because I think that's what uh, often happens, that the, there can be a contradiction um, for the patient. So they can be told, um, oh, it's very important to exercise, but then they can be told, you need to mind your back. So, so there's this contradiction all the time. So that's the advice I would give. And it's, um, I, I think from a massage perspective, I think when you're do, if you are doing it to really hit home how confident you are in that person's robustness, their resilience, their back, that if, if they're giving you words like a disc bulge or degeneration, actually saying that, you know what, I'm feeling your back here and it's in good shape, it's not crumbling apart, it's in good condition, actually repeating back some of the negative thing, things that you think people might be thinking to give them that reassurance. Um, that's 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 all I would give. H having a, a consistent, coherent message, I think, is important. Yeah. Okay. So we've got time for one more question. Um, so um, Donna's asked, if someone hasn't been diagnosed by a health professional, would you suggest this happens prior to treatment? Hmm. That would really, I think, depend on the problem. Um, it would really depend on the problem. Um, and, and again, and again, diagnosis is um, like the diagnosis could be just pain. You know, it could be persistent pain. It could be musculoskeletal pain. Um, but of course, we always have to be on the lookout. You know, if people have other medical signs and symptoms, you know, if you're unsure before treatment starts, you know, just being aware that always rule out other um, serious conditions. And, uh, but, but other than that, I, I think uh, the majority of people we see probably don't require a very specific diagnosis. But what I would say is that what's very hard on a clinical level, on an individual level, whether you're a massage therapist, a doctor or a physio, is the society we, we live in is very geared towards diagnosis and labels and biomedicalizing things. So sometimes that can be very hard to um, almost give less of a label. Um, so I think there's a lot to be done on a more societal level so people can view pain um, from a more richer perspective, that, that it's not always biomedical or structural. Okay. So I've just been advised we've got um, a little bit more time so I can ask a few more questions. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, no problem. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Okay, so Andrea wants to know what do what to do with chronic pain patients that had been suffering long term, like over ten years, and already had a negative perception of pain. What do you do with those people? Again, I uh, I would spend a lot of time listening to them. So so when when the when you say negative perception of, of pain, I'd really like to know why they have a negative perception of pain and what are the types of things they've been told and what are the types of things that they're avoiding and not doing. Because I often find, um, so, so you said a person uh, long-term over 10 years, yeah. a lot of those people have, yeah, a lot of those people have never had time to actually talk about what they think or um or what they've been told they, they've never really been heard out i feel um i would try and do something different with them um um like 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 stuff like um the the more the newer pain education and the more empowering approaches they are very different to to what people have received before and i think listening out to people, um, 
letting them share their own experience of their back pain and kind of just working with them over time to get them back to stuff that they that they value because uh, we might find that their perception of their back pain is very negative because they've been treated really badly you know they've been told the wrong stuff they haven't been listened to they've been given a very biomedical um, solution it hasn't worked so they're right maybe to feel negative so I would just say to try your best uh, the listening and trying something different that isn't always the same biomedical approach to people's conditions. Okay, thank you. Um, so Collins asked, do people with a more parasympathetic orientation respond better to a medicalized diagnosis of NSLBP so, than those that are more sympathetically orientated? Hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to answer that one. I'm, I'm not sure. I guess that's a bit like the question around uh, the personality traits and the anxiety levels. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I, I think maybe some of this on an individual level, you might need to just see how the words you use drop on that day with a person and go from there. Maybe it can be hard to judge how any, how each and every individual will respond to to a medicalized diagnosis or, or less medicalized i'm not yeah i'm not sure about that one okay <laughs> um <laughs> so uh can giving broad oh, what happened to that one there it is can giving broad diagnosis take uh as given false hope because we are not supposed to diagnose as a massage therapist often feels tricky to approach this matter Yeah, so giving a diagnosis, can it give false hope? Um, I think it can, yeah. Mm. As in, if you, were, if you were giving, and I think that's a lot of the problem. A lot of people are giving, given a diagnosis and they're given a treatment to match that diagnosis. The treatment doesn't work. So then it's up in the air as to, well, was the diagnosis right in the first place if the treatment you provided um, didn't work? Um, I'm aware, yeah, of not being able to provide a di diagnosis, but I think um, as, a, as a healthcare professional, you have a really important um, role because people can often come to you and they've already received a label elsewhere. So maybe you are a person that you might be spending more time with them than maybe a doctor spends with them. So you'll probably maybe have more time to hear about how they're feeling and what they think of a label. and. Um, while your role might not be in giving an initial diagnosis, you might be someone that's reassuring them about um, the way a situation can can get better. Um, it's, it's definitely a blurred area though. Okay. Um, so Lee's asked, uh, lately I've been referring to NSLBP as benign back pain because I feel like people do respond favorably to the word benign. I also avoid the word chronic, preferring persistent instead. Words really matter. If you do use a label with a client, what is it? Um, I think, yeah, I think for me as a, as, a, as a clinician, when people come to me, they've already had so many labels that they're happy not to be given another label. So I think um, I... I just either say um, an episode of back pain or for a person that has a persistent low back pain, we just work together on the factors that might be contributing to their pain experience um, without giving a specific label. But sometimes this is very difficult. I think when people have received lots of labels in the past and they haven't worked, people are happy then not to receive another label. But I think when you meet someone very acutely, they can be very enthusiastic towards labels. So that can be um, very difficult. I have used sprain before with people because I think for people that have a very physical biomedical understanding of their back pain in the acute stage, sometimes you can really annoy them by not giving them something a bit more specific. Um, but sprain is one that again has some issues. People feel like it's something that will recover because they think of it like an ankle sprain, but also it, it, it talks a lot about um, tissue damage. You know, it gives feelings of tissue damage. I try and avoid labels if I can. That's basically my answer. Okay. 
Um, would you agree clients would pre prefer a negative report or a negative diagnosis than a therapist avoiding the question? Negative report or a negative diagnosis. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by negative diagnosis, um, negative report. So um, maybe referring to um, a diagnosis that they've received from a doctor um, that, um, you know, they've got that bulging disc and they're unable to do this activity or that activity because it might exacerbate that bulging disc, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a... That, that's a that's a good question. Um, would you would prefer a negative report? Yes, that could be the case that uh, I guess this is the issue on an individual level. People might prefer the certainty in a label, even if it's negative and scary, than being given an uncertain label. Um, but I think what happens here is that's okay if a person recovers, they have acute back pain, they recover, but I think the negative diagnosis and reports becomes an issue over time if it's somebody that doesn't get better and you're giving them a negative label for no reason. Yeah, that, that's a that's yeah, that's an interesting an, an interesting question. We'll probably need more research on this, you know, more interviewing people with back pain, lots more research to get people's perspectives, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also um, your slides from your presentation today, would they be made available to? Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. And uh, people can email me if they have any questions as well. Yeah. And I'm happy to share the slides. Happy to share. Yeah. Anything. Uh, I like some, somebody give a comment here in the chat box. It's really easy to give a label and very hard to remove it. I think, yeah, that should have been probably a conclusion on my slide. That's a very good way of, of putting it. Um, it's easy to say something, but then it's very hard to remove the consequences of what you say. Yes, I have to agree. Excellent, Mary, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to actually hand back over to uh, Michelle. So Michelle is going to introduce our exercise snack session. Nice to meet you, Mary. Thank you very much. You too. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Mary and Joe. That was a really great start to the morning. If you've been able to follow any of the chats, there's been some really positive um, uh, responses to what you've said.